Turn over to Titus chapter 3 this morning. Today is the uh, last day of the, my seventh year on staff here. I just want to thank Pastor Skeving so much for the opportunity he's given me to be here on staff. Um, it's really been a blessing to me. I don't know if it's been a blessing to you. I don't really care. It's been a blessing to me, so it's all good. Also, Brother Weiss. Brother Weiss, where are you? There you are. Okay. Um, I, I, do, I, I'm, I'm, I really am sorry that the Packers didn't get into the playoffs. I'd like to see the Vikes and Packers in the playoffs, but, you know, it happens. And Vikes are going in. But, you know, ultimately, um, thanks for turning it up, you know, the football thing. Um, ultimately, it really doesn't matter because football players are the guys who couldn't make the hockey team. Amen? Amen. That's right. So anyway, let's, uh, after that spiritual introduction, let's have a prayer and we'll uh, get, get moving. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for the opportunity we have here to be here this morning. Lord, we ask that you bless our, our time now as we take a look at these last two faithful sayings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, Second Titus, Second Titus, Second Titus. We got the wrong one up here. There we go. We've been in a series, a five-part series in three weeks. No. What are you going to do? Um, on the faithful sayings that Paul presented to two young men who were, who were working in churches in, uh, in the Middle East, or rather in, in Asia Minor, uh, Timothy and Titus. And we're done to the last two today. And just to re- recap, the first three, they're, they're, they're faithful sayings. Where he uses a Greek phrase, pistos o logos. Thank you. Greek guy over there. Um, faithful is the word, or this is a faithful saying, or this is a true saying. He uses it five times. And... Uh, just quickly, I'll, I'll just, just review them real quick. First Timothy 1, Paul wrote this to Timothy regarding the gospel. First Timothy 1, and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. That faithful saying is the dividing line between false doctrine and true doctrine, between a false gospel and a true gospel. And unless you hold to that and you've experienced that, you will not have a true gospel. But then over in 1 Timothy 3, the second faithful saying, there's in verse 1 there, this is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. This has to do with those who aspire to some kind of leadership, either pastorate or some, someone else, that it's, they, they're desiring something that's worthwhile. That's a true saying. Because it gives you an opportunity to serve the Lord in an even, even greater capacity. But then over in 1 Timothy 4, verses 7, or 8 and 9, rather, we read this. Uh, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godly, godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and that which is, in, which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all expect, acceptation. The idea here is that regarding true religion, bodily exercise, the physical... What we do in the physical realm isn't as important as what we do on the inside between us and God. Godliness. That's what gives us true religion. Uh, the, the outward expression of that inward faith that we have in Christ. Okay? Anything else just will not make it. And today we're going to be looking again at Titus 3. And I'm going to read several. Actually, we're going to go through the entire book quickly. Because uh, it's a reasonably short book. And I have a captive audience. <laughs> Beginning in verse 3 of Titus 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life." This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly. This one is in regard, this, this faithful saying is in regard to Christian behavior. Basically, the faithful saying is, God saves men for a reason. Okay? Uh, and that's what Paul's testimony there was all about. But, the context of this, Paul has been giving a group of commands to Titus regarding how he should work with the people on the island of Crete. The, the Christians on the island of Crete. There are several churches there. And repeatedly he uses the word speak, exhort, remind, or some other ways to, to tell them to instruct the Christian believers about certain things that are necessary for the Christian life. And as we go through the first two chapters here, and we'll go through them quickly, you'll see that apparently these Christians, and particularly the Christian believers, they're a pretty out of control bunch. 
They didn't really seem to have their act together very much at all. And now, you know, I know I like to think that I've got my act together, which, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, others might dis- disagree. But you know, you know how it is. We like, to, we like to assume that we're doing okay. But in reality, we might not be. And, you know, it depends on, you know, in, in this case, they obviously weren't. Beginning in chapter 1, Paul takes the Christians, Christians to task regarding their general behavior. Beginning in verse 5 of chapter 1, we read this. For this cause left I, that's Titus, the, the left, the decree, left I the in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. So, there are some things were wanting, and he had to ordain elders. Apparently they didn't have any pastors. If any be blameless, we're talking about the pastors, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of rioting or unruly. It sounds kind of like uh, 1 Timothy 4, doesn't it? Or 1 Timothy 3, doesn't it? For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given a wine, no striker, not given a filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, to, by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now think about this for a second here. Titus gets sent to this island out in the Mediterranean to help the Christians there get established in the faith and to find some pastors. And he says, I want you to find pastors that can establish these people in sound doctrine so that they can convince the gainsayers, vain talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, their mouths must be stopped because they subvert whole houses. One of themselves, and then he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans. The Cretans were the ones that were doing all this stuff. Now, the people who got saved obviously were saved, but the implication is that even the people in the church may have been still had some of this in their background. These people were, you know, were, were in, a, in a rather bad way. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. He's not telling the false teachers to be sound in the faith. He's telling the Christian, he's tell, he wants Titus to tell the Christian believers, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. In other words, the Christian believers were apparently holding on to some things that weren't right. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. We may have seen, remember that from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1 about uh, Jewish fables and uh, other things. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now, is he talking to unsaved people there in that last two or three verses? He's been telling Titus here that he has to rebuke the believers sharply. And then he tells them, look, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Is he talking to Christians or unchristians? Non-Christians. It sounds like he might be talking to the believers, about the believers, that some of them are unto good works reprobate. Even though they claim to know Christ, their lives are not showing anything. Now, that leads to the next one. In chapter 2, we read this in verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, chaste keepers at home, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The idea, I think, based upon the context there of chapter 1, is that the old men and the old women and the young women were not doing those things. They were not sober. They were not chaste. They were not keepers at home. They were not uh, temperate. They were not sound in faith. They were not sound in charity. These people were not living the way they ought to. And so he's telling he's telling Titus, look, you've got some work to do here. You've got to work with these. And then in verse 6, he says this. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things, showing thy, thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorrupted gravity and sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Now, again, he hasn't switched over, said he's switching over to talking about unsaved people there. There are apparently some young men who are, um, that are of the contrary part. Um, and they need to be made ashamed 
by seeing Titus's life. Um, because they're going, to, because they're not living the way they ought to. They're saying evil things about Christians. They're they're not living the way they ought to. And so he's, he's rebuking one more time. And then in verse nine we read this: exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things. Not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. These folks had some real issues going on here. But then in verse eleven we read this: for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and, and, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. And then he makes this last, state, this last sentence. It's often, often missed. Let no man despise thee. Paul's concern was that when Titus came in here, he was dealing with a pretty rough crowd, even among the Christians. And they might not want to hear what he has to say. And they may just end up despising him for what he's doing. He's warning them, look, you need to stand up. You need to be a man here because you're going to have a rough time of it. This would have been a real rough place to go. Obviously, they needed some help with their Christian behavior, <laughs> apparently. But then in, verse, in, in chapter 3, um, Paul gives one final command regarding the Cretans' behavior, Christians behavior in society and among the lost. All of that was just about their behavior among themselves. Can you imagine being in a church like that? But now he's telling them, look, there's some things you need to do towards the lost as well. In verse 1, we read this. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, but gentle, uh, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, he gives them five different things that he wants to command them to do, or that he wants to put them in mind to do. First of all, they need to be subject to principalities and powers. This is regarding those who rule over them. Need, they need to be in subjection to the authorities around them, the government around them, and those, those who are over them. They're not supposed to be insurrectionists, finding ways to, to uh, undermine the authority that's over them, because that's based upon chapters 1 and 2, probably what they were doing. But then second of all, he says to obey magistrates. This regard, a magistrate is someone who is involved in executing or administering the law. We view a magistrate primarily as a law, law enforcement officer of some kind. Apparently, these people didn't like cops very much. Okay? They would be scoff laws, willing to go a little too fast, maybe, or do other things to show that they didn't really have any respect for authority. But then, also, it told them to be ready to every good work. This is regarding the needs of society. They're supposed to be looking out for those that they can give, do, do a good work for, so that they can help be a blessing to, rather than thinking about solely for their own benefit. That's, that's the opposite of being ready to do every good work. But then in verse 2, to speak evil of no man. <clears throat> this is regarding their fellow citizens. They're not supposed to be slandering and pushing and jockeying for position. They're supposed to be taking, taking care to be kind to those around them and speak kindly of those around them. Uh, even, as we know, even those who are their enemies. But apparently they weren't even doing that much. And then finally, there to be no brawlers but gentle, showing meekness unto all men. This is regarding their public persona, how they should portray themselves. They're not supposed to be, they're supposed to be gentle and kind. They're not supposed to be bullying and bragging. They're supposed to be humble men, humble women, that show themselves to be followers of Christ. And by so doing, they'll do the right things, they'll say the right things, they'll have the right attitudes. And ultimately, their churches will get cleared up because if they're really doing those things that are listed in chapters 1 and 2, their churches are probably a disaster area. Um, you talk to the pastors about what it would have been like to be in a church like that with those kind of problems going on. But, so, Paul has given Titus these commands. And then in verse 3, he gives them an example for why the Christians should change their behavior. For we ourselves, he says, also were sometimes foolish, Disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hating, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly 
through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of, of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. In these things, I will that thou affirm constantly. What is he saying? He's saying, look, there's a reason that we have to do this. I used to be just like the Cretans, says Paul. I was foolish. He had no godly guidance in his life. He was disobedient. He had no desire to follow authority. He was deceived. He was blinded by his own beliefs. He was serving diverse lusts and pleasures. That is, he was serving himself rather than others. He was living in malice and envy. That is, he's motivated by his own lusts and prejudices. He was hateful and hating one another. He was at odds with everyone around him. Remember what Paul used to do? Even though he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a very religious man, he claims that all of these things were true of him. He was believing false doctrine. He was acting like a fool. He was hateful and hating, one, and hating everyone around him. But then, verses 4 through 7, a cure came into his life. It says in verse 5, in the middle of the verse there, he saved us. I was living this way, but he saved me. When did he do that? Well, verse 4, it says, But after the kindness, that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, Jesus came, died on a cross, and rose again. And because of that, the gospel came to all men. And that gospel came to Paul. And Paul believed on it. That gospel is what saved him. But then how did he get saved? Well, he mentions there in verse, verses 5 and 6, First of all, it wasn't by works of righteousness which we have done. Think about what he has just said about the Cretans in chapters 1 and 2. About all the things that they need to correct in their lives. Both saved and unsaved, but particularly the saved people. And how he's saying, look, my salvation was not by works of righteousness. I was a fool. I was deceived. I was disobedient. I was, all, I was hateful. I was all of these things. There's no way that my behavior could have saved me. But according to his mercy... By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord. Washing of regeneration refers to, refers to being made alive when he trusted in Christ. And then renewing of the Holy Ghost refers to the Spirit being given to him so he could now live the Christian life. The point being, Paul is saying, look, I used to be just like them. But God made me new when I trusted in him. And now I can live the way he wants me to. And so can the Christians. And so can you. If you trust in Christ, you can live a new life. In fact, you're expected to. So, what was the whole purpose of this, of this faithful saying? Well, in verse 8, once again, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good or profitable unto all men. So, positively, Titus is supposed to be telling them this story and all those other things, so that he can affirm the fact that they can live this kind of life that they're supposed to live. Paul was in the same shape you were in. He got saved, now look how he's doing. You, Christians, can do the same thing. Your Christianity can change you, if you will let it do so. But then in verse 9, he gives them a negative side to this. But avoid foolish questions, and genealogies, and contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Titus is telling him, look, okay, the Cretans are a handful, and you got your work cut out for you, but if you tell them the change that came in my life, and the change that can be in their life because they've trusted him, that's great. But remember, there are also people that are teaching false doctrines here, trying to lead them away, and are doing the wrong thing. You need to deal with them as well. Give them a chance to repent. A, a heretic after the first and second admonition. You don't just condemn them as a heretic, but give them a chance to change. And if they refuse to do so, then reject them. Knowing why? Well, uh, he's subverted. He's uh, self-destroying. He's sinning. And what he's been teaching is causing, well, foolish questions, questions that have no clear answers. Genealogies, matters about which the Bible is silent. Contentions, debating over things that are not worth fighting for. Strivings about the law, demanding adherence to my interpretation. These false teachers are demanding things of the Cretans that are just confusing the issue. Not only do they have their own issues that they have to work out to get right so they can walk right with God, but they have these false teachers that are pushing them away from the God, what little gospel that they've held on to. So they're, you know, they're, 
They could very easily fall into things that they shouldn't be. It's unprofitable for them to have these teachers around. Um, the right behavior will not, never come about, but also they'll be open to all sorts of error, according to Paul. Consequently, they need to follow that faithful saying, that faithful saying, that is, to see what happened to Paul before and after he trusted Christ. Because by seeing what the gospel did to him, getting rid of all that wickedness in his life by faith, and the Holy Spirit giving the ability he could now live the Christian life, they can do the same thing. And by hanging on to that gospel that Paul gave them, they'll be strong enough to fight off the false teachers. The point of all this is that that faithful saying was there to give them a basis for their Christian behavior so that they could start growing in grace the way they ought to. But if you would turn over to 2 Timothy, chapter 2. For the sake of my old Sunday school class, Matthew, Mark, Luke, 2 Timothy. Beginning in verse 10 of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, we read this. Therefore, says Paul, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Now this one's a little bit harder to follow, but the faithful saying here basically is this. There is no success in the Christian life unless there's a sacrifice by the Christian. There is no success without suffering. Or, put another way, there is no crown without a cross. If you're going to live the Christian life, effort has to be put into it. And there will be struggle. And there will be trouble. But it has to be done. This faithful saying is regard to faithfulness in our service. Beginning in verse 1, Timothy is being given some orders by Paul. Verses 1 and 2 we read this. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. What he's doing is he's talking to Timothy regarding his ministry. And first he tells him personally, he needs to be strong in the grace of Christ. What is that? Well, that's sticking to the gospel that he already knows, what, what, what Paul has taught him and what he knows about the Bible. He needs to stick to that. Because why? It's the power that he will have to succeed in his ministry there. Remember, Paul had sent Timothy to work among the Ephesians on the west coast of Asia Minor to help in that church there that, he had, that Paul himself had started many years before. And now he's telling him to, to uh, be strong in the grace of Christ, that grace that he has received, that he knows that it's, it's there in his salvation. But then publicly he tells him also in verse 2, be steadfast in teaching others. Once more to verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same can commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is how he can have his success in his ministry. Not only having the power, but also the plan for success. What is that? That he should be teaching what was given to him by Paul to faithful men in such a way that those faithful men will be, able to, will be willing and able to teach those to other people also. In other words, what we have here is four generations, spiritual generations of Christians. We have Paul. I love doing it. Too much fun. I'll move it down a little bit there. Paul led Timothy to Christ. Or, well, excuse me, no, I, I stand correct on that. If you read Acts 16, actually Timothy was already saved. But Paul was Timothy's mentor. He taught him many things about the gospel. He's telling Timothy to teach other faithful men that he finds there in Ephesus. So, Paul is the first generation, Timothy is the second generation. These faithful men whether Timothy has led him to Christ, whether they were converts of Paul or others have led him to Christ, there will be faithful men that Timothy is supposed to teach, and then those are supposed to be motivated by what Timothy teaches them to teach others, a fourth generation of Christians. This is the way the gospel and all the teachings about the gospel are supposed to pass on from generation to generation. Now, this is stuff we all know, or we should know, but this was the goal that, that Paul has said. This is the original statement of this. Paul told Timothy, look, this is a generational thing. You give it to somebody, he'll give it to somebody, he'll give it to somebody, he'll give it to somebody. And it can end up in Fargo, North Dakota 2,000 years from now, even though there is no Fargo, North Dakota right now. And there'll be people that need to hear the gospel, and they'll get the gospel because you were faithful, Timothy, in Ephesus. 
Now, that's regarding his ministry. He's supposed to be strong in the grace of Christ and to be steadfast in teaching. But then in verses 3 through 6, we see that this, regarding his misery. He says in verse 3, there thou, thou therefore endure hardness. Endure hardness. Difficulty is going to come to you, Timothy. Now, we know from reading First and Second Timothy, Timothy wasn't in anywhere near the, 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 uh, the snake pit that Titus was in. Okay? Ephesus seemed to have been a pretty solid place at the time. In fact, that Christ sends a letter to Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 as being one of the finer churches of the time, of the, of the first century. Though they did have some issues, they were still a pretty good church. No other letters were ever written to Crete, to Crete as far as I know. Uh, but Tim- Timothy was in a, certainly a better situation than Titus was. But yet, he's telling him that he should endure hardness. Why? Because ministry is hard. I've heard many people say, ministry is really easy if there's no people involved. That's true with most jobs, but particularly in ministry. And it, I, wouldn't lose, I wouldn't want to get rid of the college kids for, for, for all the world. But you guys, I'll tell you. <laughs> There are times, as Mrs. Strauss says, college students, honestly. She's right. (laughs) Anyway, endure hardness. Well, how are you supposed to do that? Well, Paul gives Timothy three analogies here for how he's supposed to endure hardness. First of all, he's supposed to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. As a soldier, Timothy is supposed to endure hardness. How is that? Well, soldiers do not become entangled in this life's matters. They endure hardness. They put aside things that would be, uh, make their lives comfortable. Why? Because they know that the life of a soldier is going to be hard. So they make sure that they are fit and ready to be what they need to be. Why? Because this allows them, according to the second half of that verse 4 there, this allows them the freedom to please their commanders. If you endure hardness, if you're willing to put up with the training and the hassles and the headaches there are in being a soldier, you'll be the kind of soldier that will please your commander. So, Timothy, should endure this hardness as a soldier. But then, second of all, he's supposed to endure it as an athlete. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Athletes need to train according to the rules to master their sports. They need to endure hardness. You're supposed to, if you're a baseball player, the greatest sport in the world, by the way. Amen? Nobody cares. Okay. God bless Bill Mazeroski. Nobody has a clue. Who who knows who Bill Mazeroski is? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, Pirates. Grand Slam in the bottom of the ninth, 1960 World Series. Anyway, I digress. Athletes are supposed to strive lawfully. A baseball player needs to work out. Now, admittedly, there are baseball players that look like they don't work out much. But for the most part today, because of their contracts and such, they are pretty, pretty good athletes. They're world-class athletes. Even, even baseball players, even golfers are actually in pretty good shape. But you probably, if you know anything about sports, you know the hassles for those who weren't striving lawfully in the last decade or so. The steroid scandal in baseball, those who are... Have their, their, their reputations have been tainted because they were using steroids, which were against the rules in baseball, to give themselves an advantage while they were playing. What does that verse say again? And if a man also strive for masters, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. I know of at least four baseball players who may never get into the Baseball Hall of Flame, Fame, even though they're deserving, because why? They did not play lawfully. They broke that rule. You have to, what is it? We have to endure hardness as an athlete, by training lawfully and sticking to it so we can master our sport the right way. And then, by having lawful mastery, we will gain the victory. We'll gain the prize. Okay? But then Timothy is supposed to endure hardness as a soldier, as an athlete, but also as a farmer. Verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Now this one's a little bit, a little bit backwards from what you might be thinking here. Farmers labor... To produce crops. That's why a farmer puts up with everything he puts up with. He endures hardness to to grow crops. But that's the only way that he can become a partaker of those crops. If he's not enduring the hardness of being a farmer, 
and all the work that's entailed on a farm, he'll never have anything to show for it. And consequently, he won't have a chance to eat. The point is that as a farmer, you need to endure that hardness to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Just like a soldier has to endure hardness to please his commander, an athlete has to endure hardness so that he can win lawfully, the farmer needs to do the same thing. Work hard to gain the fruits of his labor. And then in verse 7, Paul says this, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Basically, Paul is telling Timothy to remember, the successful Christian life requires suffering and sacrifice, and that there is no crown without a cross, unless you're willing to work hard at this ministry. You will not see the benefits arising from that ministry. And then Paul gives three examples out of his own life, beginning in verse 8, of how this principle, this, this, this faithful saying works. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. He uses Christ's life as an example of how you're supposed to uh, uh, endure hardness. He says this from my gospel. I tell people this all the time. Christ was of the seed of David. He came as a man to do what? To die for us. But what was Christ's success? What was his reward? He rose from the dead. That was, the, that was his reward of the suffering he went through, of the hardness he went through. He came for the purpose of dying for us and then we received the reward of rising from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the Father. By the way, the same sort of thing that we share in if we're Christians. Okay? But then, verse 9, he also gives the example of his own pain. Verse 9, wherein I suffer trouble, that is, wherein in this gospel, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bounds, but the word of God is not bound. Paul's sacrifice, he was imprisoned for the gospel. In fact, in 2 Timothy, this is the last letter that Paul writes. He is in prison, he's in the Mamertine prison in Rome, awaiting execution at the hand of Caesar. He's, he's lived out his life and he's ready to die. But he knows that's why he's there. He had to sacrifice for this, but the success that he's experiencing because of that suffering, that hardness that he's enduring, is that the gospel he preaches is not bound or not limited because of his suffering. He can suffer and he can be in prison. He can know that he's going to die. Why? Because the gospel that he's been preaching is the right gospel and that gospel will continue on. Over in Philippians chapter 1, I don't have, I don't have time to go over there right now, but... Uh, Paul basically tells them, look, there are people that fight the gospel that I'm preaching. They say that I'm not preaching it right. There's another gospel that needs to be preached. And some are preaching contention. Some preach it the way that I've taught it. He says, it doesn't really matter as long as the gospel is being preached. All Paul was concerned about was that the gospel would be preached. His success came in the fact that the gospel would get out. And he's saying, despite my suffering, the fact that I am suffering does not stop that gospel. In fact, it furthers the gospel. He suffered because of the gospel, but he had no problem with that because he knew his suffering would be to the furtherance of the gospel. There's a success there. But then finally, according to Paul's purpose there in verse 10, he says this, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. What is his sacrifice? He doesn't care that he's in prison or that he's going to die soon. He endures all of this. Why? For the elect's sake. Why? So that some of them... Some people will hear the gospel and get saved. He endures that hardness. Why? Because the success for him is other people doing what he did. That is, trust Christ and know for sure they're going to heaven. So, all of that, down to verse 11, we see this. It is a faithful saying. Well, what's the faithful saying? Well, the faithful saying then is basically that principle. There's no crown without a cross. And Paul appears to use a poem here in verses uh, 11 through 13, to illustrate the point one more time that eternal reward must be preceded by suffering. Positively, he says this in verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. That's our salvation. If we've died with Christ, and by the way, getting saved is a sacrifice. If you look at it from the right side, you're, you're setting aside yourself to take on the life of another. That's a sacrifice. And there's a reward for surrendering yourself to him. What is that? Salvation. 
So our own salvation evidences that principle that there's no crown without a cross. By nailing ourselves to that cross, we will receive a crown. But then second of all, in verse 12, we read this. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Our glorification that we will receive in heaven for the faithfulness we have in this life also proves this principle. If we suffer with Christ, as Christians, as faithful Christians, we will reign with him. But then negatively, Paul points out, even the negative side proves this principle. Verse, thir- uh, verse 12, second half. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Because of the punishment that we have for denying Christ, our denying him keeps us from, receive- from taking part in that principle. It does not affect the principle. If you suffer, you'll receive a crown. If you deny Christ, what will happen? You will not receive the crown. There will be no benefit to you. But then, finally in verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. If we were to be proven to be liars about having trusted Christ, if we deny him completely and walk away from the faith, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. That is, our unbelief cannot stop this principle being true. Those who have continued faithful, those who have trusted Christ, they will reap the reward. They will suffer and they will get the crown. If we walk away, or if we have denied him, or if we have not trusted Christ, it won't affect Christianity in the least because the principle still stands. So, what did it have to do with Timothy? Well, Timothy was supposed to uh, take this principle and give it to the Ephesians. Verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they... Strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Positively, they're supposed to be reminded of these things by Timothy. Timothy was to show them that this, this principle is true, and that they can go on like, he, like Paul did, fight the good fight of faith, because there's a reward if you will endure this hardness and strive the way you ought to. But negatively, he tells them, look, he charges them, charging them not to strive about words to no profit. Timothy was to warn the Ephesians about false teaching. Now, he'd already done that over in 1 Timothy 1 and 1 Timothy 4, where he talks about how there were false teachers that were teaching uh, Jewish fables and other things like this. He's telling them, look, striving about these things has no value. There's no value to fight over these things. And also, these things will subvert the hearers. That is, if they get entangled with these false teachings... It will cause them to walk away. In fact, it will affect them so that they will not want to endure hardness and consequently receive the crown for that endurance. So, Timothy, please, tell your people they need to endure this hardness because there's a reward for it. And don't let them get entangled in anything that can keep them from gaining that reward because that's the purpose of Christian service. And that's what we should be living for. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for these lessons, these faithful sayings that, Timothy, uh, that Paul gave to Timothy and Titus. Lord, we ask that we'd take what principles we have here this morning and apply them to our own lives, that we would clean up whatever is in our lives that needs to be cleaned up, but also, Lord, that we'd be willing to see the value in, in being faithful in our service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.